A very good afternoon to all present over here. This is Deepika Nandanwar from GH Raisan University of Management and Research. Today, I'm welcoming you all in the virtual session of Orange City Literature Fest. This session will be of 40 minutes. Today, we have a very interesting topic, which is Unleashing the Vajra, Nepal's journey between India and China by one and only Sujiv Shakya. Sir is a thought leader who traverses many world. He earned the title of Nepal's CEO, Chief Internal Optimist, for the optimism he projected in, the, in his book, Unleashing Nepal. He writes and speaks extensively on business, development, economy, and leadership. He writes a regular column for the Kathmandu Post. His book, Unleashing the Vajra, Nepal's Journey Between India and China, was launched at the Jaipur Literature Festival. We also having with us our dear moderator, Arun Anand, is an author and journalist who has authored six books so far, including bestsellers, Know About RSS and The Saffron Surge, Untold Story of RSS Leadership. His latest book was on Ra Ram Janma Bhumi, Earth, Evidence, Faith, which he co-authored. He's founder, editor of research and reference website, www.thenationalistreview.com. He's also a research director at Delhi-based think tank, which are Vinimai Kendra. Now, I would like to hand over this session over to you guys. Uh, thank you, Deepika. And uh, thank you, Sujeevji. It's a pleasure to have you here. Uh, and uh, because the time is very short, so I won't go into you know too much of formalities in terms of. Uh, uh, and coming to straight to the first uh, question, uh, what exactly triggered the idea of this book, and what is the significance of this title? Oh. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you, Arun, and uh, nice to be here at the Orange City Literary Literature Fest. Uh, basically, what uh, triggered this was that I wrote Unleashing Nepal in 2010, uh, 9, it was released. And uh, at that time, I had just got out of a corporate job. I was leading Nepal's one of the largest business groups. And I just thought that it is important to have investments. Uh, it is important to have management prudence if you would like to bring about economic transformation. Of course, I had started the journey of redefining Nepal, and not as a small country, but as a country uh, with 30 million people, nearly 49th populated, then 40th populated country in the world, land linked to India and China, two of the largest uh, global economies. And so that is how Unleashing Nepal began. But over the 10 years of work I've done with my own consulting firm, traversed the world, worked in many countries, I figured out that it is not only essential to have investments and management to bring about economic transformation, but it is important to have societal transformation in order to bring about economic transformation. So the Unleashing the Vajra journey uh, talks about societal transformation. And when we are talking about societal transformation, it is also important to look at the past. And uh, Nepal is the oldest, you know, a nation state in South Asia that was never colonized. And it has history of, you know, thousands of years, which is very little talked about. And everybody talks about from Nepal since the Shah dynasty. And so I said, you know, let me go back to a bit of history, look at what was happening, uh, uh, the migration, the relationship with uh, Tibet, China, uh, India, and then try to define what can happen and what are the potential, what are the possibilities, and try to create a narrative that shows, uh, that talks about the potential, talks about what Nepal can do and what Nepal can unleash uh, its potential. So that's the sort of general, uh, you know, perspective from which that forced me to, you know, think of this book and write. As you uh, said that, uh, uh, so there is a historical connection between uh, you know, 
uh, Nepal and India, and there is apparently also historical connection between Nepal and Tibet, and then some other surrounding countries also. Now, when uh, you know, uh, generally the perception has been that India has been like a big brother, uh, and there has been you know a lot of resentment also at times in Nepal. Of late, uh, the the situation seems to be. Uh, uh, things had gone pretty, uh, you know, bad. But now it seems uh, that uh, things are back on track. But when we look at the, there is a growing concern that the influence of China, especially with communist regime being there, the influence of China is growing too much in uh, Nepal, and uh, the, the and uh, India in, there is a lot of concern about that. In India and I think uh, globally also, because strategically Nepal is uh, uh, placed in a very very important view. It has a very important geo strategic position. So, uh, how do you look at, or if you can, could tell our viewers and listeners that uh, the relationship between China and Nepal, how it is shaping up, and what is the role which China, what is the role that China has been playing? And is likely to play in your future. I'm saying, especially in context of the economic transformation of Nepal. I think, uh, uh, see, we cannot change geography. Okay, we are we are in between India and China. That's a reality that we need to ex accept. And let us also accept the fact that two countries compete as uh, economic uh, powers. Uh, so that is something also we cannot ignore. Uh, we need to look at historical perspective because while a lot of discussions takes place between deep relationship between India and Nepal, we need to also understand that there was deep relationship between uh, China and Nepal also, and especially Tibet and Nepal because you know it's as an immediate uh, Himalayan neighbor. And historically, it was Nepali artists that you know and Nepali thought leaders that took Buddhism to Tibet. It was Nepali architect that built the city of Beijing. Uh, so these are important understanding to have that in the northern border, we, st we do have a similar relationship as in the south border. So the history is important. When we look at the current context, uh, we need to also understand that China has been very aggressive uh, since 2013 after their Belt, Ro Belt and Road Initiative. But we saw Chinese uh, um, activities in Nepal increasing post the April 2015 earthquake. So when the earthquake of 2015 happened, Nepal you know, was slowly going towards stability, looking at a new constitution, the earthquake happened. And China also came in initially for help. India did some amazing uh, help. But then there was a blockade in September of 2015. And when the blockade happened, for after we were reeling under uh, and you know recovering from an earthquake a blockade happened and that perhaps provided china an opportunity nepal started looking at uh, an alternative to the indian you know sort of um, uh, ports and its li land linkages to see that it needed an alternative and that's where the you know sort of uh, the reaching out to china happened and of course let's when we talk about china let us also not forget that China has been very aggressive, not only in Nepal, but throughout the region. Also, if you look at it, even in India, Chinese investments have increased dramatically uh, there, you know, to the extent that it had to be you know, sort of stopped to a large extent. So this is a new reality we live with. And that is what I talk in my book is very important to understand the future. Because whatever said and done by 2040, like in the 17th century, India and China are going to be the two leading economies in the world. And if we look at Nepal benefited tremendously in the 15th, 16th, 17th, up to the 15th, 16th, 17th century, till the, the British, uh, you know, sort of came to India and uh, ruled, uh, it gained tremendously as being an, uh, a state in between India and China. And that's a potential I see that is possible. But of course, uh, economics and politics ha goes hand to hand, but it's important Nepal also understand how it negotiates itself. Uh, there are uh, stories of how certain countries have got into trouble, uh, whether it be taking too much of aid or too much of debt. So Nepal needs to look at it from a very, very uh, 
economic perspective, uh, looking at investments, looking at development as to what it wants, rather than taking whatever it comes on the table, whether it from, be from India or from China. So we need to rethink. And that's what I talk about in the book, that we need to put a bit of the, understand the past, but put a bit of this, you know, competitive thing behind and to see that what Nepal should do in terms of unleashing its economic potential between India and China. So, so it's important because uh, China is a player that we cannot ignore. And we need to be proactive rather than be reactive. And these are some of the thoughts I share in my book. You mentioned this uh, thing that uh, it's very important that how Nepal negotiates itself. Uh, because as you have mentioned uh, in your book also that uh, at the very title of the book itself shows that the uh, challenge in terms of how Nepal negotiates itself. Now, for negotiating itself pretty well, I think there needs to be a, a robust institutional, uh, you know, structure or framework. And how do you see uh, the internal uh, institutional structures or the democratic uh, institutions, the growth and evolution of democratic institutions? Because as we know that from a monarchy, uh, Nepal has transformed into a, a democracy, and then uh, I think. In this region, it's the only uh, country where uh, then you have a new constitution. And you know, of late, uh, off and on, there have been a lot of instability also uh, in terms of the power at the center. So uh, how do you see the evolution of democratic institutions and the growth of the democratic institutions in context of uh, ensuring that uh, Nepal's interests are taken care of and uh, no government should be able to compromise Nepal's interests to whichever ideology it may be. No, that's a very, very valid point, Arun. In terms of, uh, it's very important to have democratic institutions uh, to be strong. And I think world over, we have seen uh, that in the past couple of years, also in our neighborhood, we have seen that there has been tremendous challenges in terms of democratic institutions. But it's important, and also what is important to understand and you know sort of internalize is that, as you rightly pointed out, Nepal went through tremendous transformation in the past two decades. As you said, you know, from a Maoist insurgency, you know, the removal of a 240-year-old uh, you know sort of ruling dynasty, to from a very Kathmandu-centric a feudal structure to a federal structure with seven provinces and uh, multiple local governments. So it's a tremendous transformation. Nepal has uh, tried to uh, push itself to, to the new constitution. So it's not going to be easy. And, and we have to take it from a long-term perspective in terms of the stability. And where do we see hope? Uh, we do see hope in the sense that there are more Nepalis that are globally exposed and many of them coming back. So if you look at, for instance, in Australia, in 2018, there were about 60,000 Nepalis that went into study in Australia spending $1.3 billion. So if you look at US, there are it's, Nepal is number 11, 12, always in sending students, 10,000 of them in UK. So there are a lot of people who are going out. And earlier, there's two like people like us, we used to come to India to study. Now people are going global and they're coming back. And this is a young, uh, population that is shaping the discourse in many areas. Politics is still is a big uh, thing that needs to be transformed. But in many areas, we see the transformation of young Nepalis coming in because the reality, like in other South Asian countries, 50 percent of our people are under 25 in Nepal. So, you know, 70 percent are under 35. It's very young, uh, you know, sort of um, demographics. And so that is what again gives us hope that they are going to go into changing you know sort of uh, institution and if you look at the media i mean if you look at the online media space the community radio space uh, if you look at the type of um, now long form reviews that started coming up if you look at the type of uh, you know videos that are being made there, there, you know so there's a lot that's happening and i think uh, that gives us hope that you know somebody cannot uh, take an autocratic stand or to do a sellout to uh, another country and, you know, sort of get influenced by uh, policies imposed by other countries. And I think 
that is something that this is strong enough but definitely the politics is still dominated by the same people who have been there for past 25 30 years and that is a big challenge we face uh, there is hardly any young people hardly any women uh, so when that process becomes inclusive we would see the institutions strengthening and we see many think tanks come up uh, many institutions in different areas come up and especially again i emphasize the ones that are run by young people earlier also and uh, if you can just give us a brief overview of uh, how the FII is uh, basically the foreign institutional investors so which are the sectors they are looking at in Nepal especially in context of India and China and uh, uh, FII is from India and China so and of course from other uh, rest of the world also and uh, which, which are the sectors uh, which are what you call the sunrise sectors uh, and uh, which sectors do you think uh, are going to be the engine of growth for Nepal's economy in days to come? Uh, I think I, uh, you know, in my book I talk about what I, the acronym I use is called HATS and I, which is hydropower, agriculture, tourism, the services industry and infrastructure. So these are the five broad uh, sectors we can look at. In hydropower, we already have a large Indian as well as uh, Chinese investments. And, and we would see more uh, investments as the energy market in South Asia matures. Uh, in tourism, we do see quite a bit of investments, but given the current pandemic, it is going to take a bit of time. But uh, unfortunately, we don't see some of the large investors from our neighboring countries. Uh, we do see from the large businesses, it's more of a small mom and pop type of investors in either side of uh, be it from India or China. We don't see large uh, investors coming in. Um, in terms of uh, services sector, that is where we see a lot of, as you mentioned, the sun rising. Is that 38 percent of our exports are currently uh, IT services? So there are more than 800 firms, again run by young Nepalis, that are doing you know sort of outsourcing work, software work. Uh, they are doing you know programming work. Uh, they are do into artificial intelligence. They're into a lot of cutting edge stuff. And that's where uh, we do see um, a lot of opportunity. And that's also an area where we have been seeing foreign investments. But, but uh, for the foreign investment, uh, the challenge is also the domestic businesses, uh, which I talk about as cartelpreneurs. Uh, there is that tendency of creating cartels, uh, trying to block uh, foreign investment, trying to block liberalization. So again, this is more of a, uh, you know, a journey that every uh, nation goes through. And we'll see over a period of time as more exposed people uh, come back with global ambitions, I think there would be more um, opening up of foreign investment. Again, as we look at uh, Nepal has a, you know, sort of is linked to the two biggest markets in the world. So if you look at setting up a factory in Nepal, you can access about 400, 500 million people in India and Bangladesh. And, uh, you know, so those are opportunities. And some of the companies like Dabur and have already been leveraging that. So we would see more companies like that. And uh, yeah, so the sectors remain the same, but it is more with agility, be it in e-commerce or be it in digital finance or be it in, you know, payment systems. You know, it will be more about, uh, uh, you know, sort of robust uh, multinationals coming in and uh, investing in Nepal. You have put it very well, uh, Sujiti. Uh, I think, uh, as we have witnessed in the past also, that social capital uh, must be created to build a base on which you can build an economic uh, structure. So when I talk about social capital, broadly I'm talking about you know, the education facilities, the health facilities, the regional imbalances, which need to be, you brought it up, that the earlier things used to be very Kathmandu centric. So if you can give us a brief overview of the status of social capital, because India, despite being, uh, you know, uh, have such a big and resourceful country, and uh, despite having such tremendous GDP growth over the last uh, three decades or so, so, we are still, you know, struggling with that social capital uh, thing. So, of course, here the sheer numbers are uh, a challenge. But 
uh, India's experience has been that uh, when we built up a strong social capital, so then the decentralized growth happened. And uh, ultimately, if uh, a very uh, Kathmandu centric go growth model is going to be you know executed or implemented, so the long run it will have its own uh, you know, challenges. So in that context, I just want you to give a brief overview to our uh, viewers that what is happening on the social uh, on the social capital uh, about all these indicators, see, see. Uh, how how they are improving and what is being done. Uh, not only in terms of the government schemes, but also how the communities are looking at it and how the industries, how the corporates are looking at it. Because ultimately yeah. you require good human resources if you really want to run, you know, good companies or factories or good businesses. So if you can just give us a brief overview in terms of what is happening, what are the challenges and what do you think is the way forward? Yeah, very, very, very valid question, Arun. Uh, in terms of what's happened in the past, again, 15 years, one of the biggest uh, influences has been remittance. Earlier, a lot of Nepalese used to go to India to work. Now they, they go to Malaysia, they go to, you know, sort of uh, Middle East. And of course, knowledge workers uh, find, uh, you know, go to Europe, go to, you know, sort of uh, different parts of the world. And then uh, they work. And so, so we do see that um, there is uh, remittances have driven uh, not only consumption, but people are being able to afford education. People are being able to afford uh, a better uh, lives in terms of healthcare and uh, a better infrastructure. So that's that's a big transformation we need to see. Uh, the second is that what this federalism is going to do in the long run is that it's going to create competition between the various uh, provinces. You know, we have seven provinces. And if we look at uh, the sub-regionalism within that, say, for instance, uh, a, a, a trader in, uh, uh, in eastern Nepal or a business person is more connected to somebody in Siliguri or somebody in far west Nepal is more connected to Nepal than somebody from Kathmandu. So there are, are these uh, local business equation. Let's not forget it's an open board. Both sides of the uh, country uh, benefit tremendously from the uh, open border. Uh, so we do see that uh, changing uh, consumption pattern, changing social, uh, in social, uh, you know, in, in in say government services, thirty to thirty five percent uh, of uh, you know sort of applicants are women, and we see more women, of course, uh, mandated by law one third, but we are seeing more women coming into play. So that's going to change. I mean, that always in globally, we've seen that that changes how uh, a country moves ahead, because then you bring in an inclusion, because till now you're ignoring 50% of the population. So that that's a big, big transformation you'll see. And the affordability of uh, education and healthcare is, again, people are realizing if you educate people, like if you talk to a cab driver in Kathmandu, they would want to send their kids to Australia to study because they know once they go to study there, they'll find a job there or they'll come back. So those are sort of the transformational thinking that has taken place and it's very little talked about. And that's reflected in how, you know, uh, the restaurants are emerging, you know, is rest reflected in how people spend their leisure time, how they travel, how they move, go, you know, so so that is all being reflected. And that's a interesting societal transformation that is taking place. Again, it's driven a, a lot by young people. And that's what is going to, that gives me the hope in, you know, 2025, 20, 2030, 20, 2040, 20, that Nepal would, you know, unleash its potential. And that's, that's uh, basically the foundation in which, uh, you know, sort of uh, my book and my thoughts are uh, laid. Sujiti, I think, you know, Nepal has uh, one of the most robust uh, non-governmental organization sector, the NGO sector. And uh, they do play an important role in uh, several spheres. So, uh, what, what I, I think uh, in this region, Nepal has uh, kind of, you know, if I would say even probably maybe even better than India, but they have the literally who's who of the organizations, uh, NGOs, uh, global NGOs, which are working. 
However, so one I want to know your views on the role of the non-governmental organization, this NGO sector. Second, along with that, there is an apprehension also which is expressed. Because as we know that uh, a number of NGOs are often, you know, front of the uh, intelligence agencies or, you know, uh, some other organization uh, which, which, which try to create, you know, instability and then conversion is a big issue. So, all these issues, I'm talking about all these issues because uh, ultimately uh, in the social milieu, uh, all these issues uh, do, you know, influence the uh, growth or transformation of a society. So how do you look at the NGO sector, especially in terms of, and are there any concerns in Nepal about uh, the free flow of foreign aid to these NGOs? Um, yes, I think, uh, you know, everything has a good side and uh, not a good side. I think it's two sides of the coin. But if we look at historically, interventions of development agencies through NGOs, and especially those who have been working in healthcare, in education, in, you know, sort of uh, upliftment, uh, you know, job creation, they have contributed a lot. And, you know, and Nepal needs to be thankful to all uh, the donor countries, including India and China, who have uh, contributed quite a bit in terms of uh, you know sort of supporting uh, developmental activities but at the same time i think i totally agree with what you're saying is that there are two points of it uh, one is that a lot of free money creates a sort of a, a rent seeking mindset which in my book i talk about donor premiers and grantee premiers so rather than being entrepreneurs you look for free money from somewhere and and that has had its own uh, challenges uh, so everybody wants to rather than trying to put in your own money you're looking for free money from somewhere and also look at if we look at the global aid industry it had its challenges you know it has its good sides but there has been a lot of uh, criticism around uh, the challenges that have bred so that's one in terms of the economics part of it in terms of the societal part of it of course um because of the presence of civil society organizations uh you know be it uh, you know the the at the end are uh, 240 your monarchy had to come to an end, you know, and Maoists could not, you know, push beyond a certain point. And in that civil society organization, uh, non-governmental organizations played a big role, be it in the constitution building, because things in Nepal could have gone very bad, you know, if the king would not have, you know, sort of uh, left the, uh, the palace or the Maoists would have decided to, you know, corner Kathmandu. But then, Civil society organizations played a big role, and I think we need to complement that, and we need to bear that in mind. At the same time, we have to be very mindful of, uh, you know, sort of a uh, lot of agenda-driven organizations. And I think in the past couple of years, there has been more control uh, in the activities of INGOs, NGOs, and hopefully, we are only hope that it is not politically motivated, like in other countries where you know uh, it is a way to silence voices and so that is something that we are hoping that uh, the freedom as you're talking about for you know sort of uh, outside the government apparatus to do things and to make things happen uh, you know that remains because if you look at a lot of educational institutions healthcare institutions many of them that have been successful outside the government are run as NGOs and NGOs you know so so that's a that's so there are good positive lessons to learn, but at the same time, I think I totally agree that we have to be wary of uh, you know sort of unwanted forces using that as a platform of you know sort of influencing. But having said that, let's also also need to agree that uh, most I would say eighty percent of the NGOs do have some political connections, and that you know sort of so the the larger political uh, issues you know groupism. Uh, all that spills over day-to-day uh, -day activities of an NGO. Yeah. You have put it very uh, well. And uh, Sudhiji, another thing is that, uh, uh, now coming back to, again, the title of your book, because uh, off late there has been uh, you know, uh, a lot of tension between India and China. And as you said that, so, what is the qualitative change you see in terms of uh, in terms of a situation? Well, the situation between with the change in situation between India and China, 
and with the change of the dynamics uh, have also changed probably for Nepal in terms of how to negotiate with China and how to negotiate with India because now the sensibilities are pretty, you know, on a different uh, plane. So, uh, how do you see this India-China, you know, tension and uh, because there's a lot of economic spill out. Uh, not only the strategy, there's a lot of economic spill out. India has banned a number of, uh, you know, Chinese apps. There has been restrictions have been put on in terms of uh, giving contracts to Chinese companies. So uh, China has also been, you know, threatening and retaliating. And uh, so overall, uh, how do you see uh, this uh, the challenge for Nepal in terms of uh, does it have to renegotiate its position vis-a-vis -vis both India and China? And uh, is the present government in Nepal, seized of this uh, fact and uh, seized of uh, the change, this fact that the situation has changed. How is it handling it? And how Nepal, Nepali uh, business community is looking at? It? Uh, see, I, I, I sort of talk uh, about uh, Nepal in between uh, India and China as the grass in when between with two elephants. So when two elephants make love or they fight, it is the grass that gets trampled. Okay, so we are in a very uh, unique situation of being in between two large countries. Having said that, the way I look at, again, uh, long term, globalization is not something we can reverse. Today, despite of saying whatever we do, we don't know where our product originates or a service originates. And that's a reality we live with. And politics and economics are going to you know, coexist in different ways. So even if you look at US and China, in the past one year, a couple of years, there has been tremendous animosity on the political side, You know, um, a lot of stuff. But then if you look at from the business side, more business has been done between China and United States than ever before. Same thing with, with India and China. If you look at the trade volumes, if you look at uh, investments, despite all the discussions, there has been more economic activity because for India, if it needs to expand, China is the market. For China, if it needs to expand, India is the market. So this is a reality I think both countries will, you know, uh, beyond the politics will look at. And as long as Nepal, again, be it like many of the successful countries who have negotiated between large neighbors well, be it Singapore or Switzerland, if Nepal takes a very economic perspective to say that how do we take advantage of this? So, you know, of this situation and how do we ensure that we take decisions with economic prudence, I think that will be taken care of. Because, see, in, the politics is very complicated in Nepal. See, I, I always say openly, uh, Nepali nationalism is treated as, uh, you know, sort of uh, being anti-Indian. Uh, Nepalis have a tremendous issue if there is Indian interference, but not much of the same uh, issue if there is a Chinese intervention, you know. So these are things I've been openly talking about in you know, social media. So it's a very unique situation where um, we perceive different countries in a different way. But rather than getting sucked into the politics of it, if it realizes that we are in a position of strategic importance between these two countries, we have an open border uh, with both the countries. And if we can manage that, I think that will be, uh, you know, sort of uh, that is the long term perspective that we need to look at. In the short term, I think every politician, you know, everybody in business is going to take advantage of the, you know, fluid situation. And if you look at, you know, a, a rent seeking society, as I talk in my book, always looks at opportunities to rent seek. And currently, it's a perfect opportunity when there's a sense of, you know, sort of a, a, a strain in relations. But I do see this as a short term issue because if we look at uh, the way the world is moving, be it e-commerce, digital finance, the way technology is moving, artificial, you know, sort of intelligence, there is no way we can, you know, sort of uh, stay isolated and say we'll shut our doors. And I think Nepal needs to be very wary of that and to understand how it manages between the two countries. I want a brief comment uh, from you on uh, how do you see the, the the relationship between India and Nepal 
over the last six and a half years? Has there been a qualitative change ever since the Modi government has taken over? Uh, no, I think, uh, you know, sort of, I had written and OPED, when Prime Minister uh, Mr. Modi visited Nepal, I talked about modified relations, and I think it was a great uh, euphoria. But then the 2015 blockade did, you know, sort of create a big challenge. Uh, we can, you know, sort of discuss as to whether it was an Indian blockade or not, that we can, you know, sort of continuously. But then I think uh, the realities have to be understood by both countries. And I think the relationship relationship between India and uh, Nepal is based on people to people relations uh, the proximity of culture, societal relations, you know, I mean, that is what we need to leverage. And that is a reality both sides of the, you know, sort of uh, both sides of the border need to understand. Uh, there has been reaching out, I would say, definitely, we had just had the foreign secretary visit a couple of days before, uh, there has been uh, interest on both sides. But India needs to understand it's a new Nepal, which is globally exposed, uh, which gets remittances from around the world. And it is not India locked, as I say, you know, uh, which was uh, about, you know, five years ago. And for uh, for Nepal, it needs to realize that the open border is an economic opportunity for Nepal. Uh, there are millions of people on both sides of the border that is dependent. It it cannot be dictated by Kathmandu as to what it does with these, uh, you know, sort of how the border should move. It has to be the people in the border. I talk about border economic zones. So we need to take a perspective of, you know, a long term view. And I think as long as we push, uh, you know, sort of uh, our perspective in terms of building the relationship on a futuristic platform, because the realities have changed on both sides. For India also, Nepal is not a priority. It is priority number 65. You know, India wants to do more trade with the United States, with Europe. You know, it, ne Nepali politicians think that India is always thinking about Nepal. No, that's, that's, that's the reality that we need to live with. So Nepal needs to push itself to be heard. And I think cultivate the relationships as it has done in the past. And uh, so that is how we see. Um, um, and, you know, uh, challenges in relationships happen. But we need to amend those, mend those relationships and then move with a, in a positive direction. That's how I see it. And I think in the current administration in India, we do see some interest in rebuilding the relations. And I think it is for Nepal also to not use it in, as a, you know, a political tool, but to really engage in the rebuilding the relations. That's how I would see it. Thank you. Uh... So much, Sujivji. I think it was a wonderful conversation uh, which we had, and uh, all the best for uh, not only this book but for many more books to come. I think we need people like you who can provide you know, uh, uh, an interesting and a neutral perspective, and a very uh, the book which you have written is very informative. So I think currently the most important thing is that we need more information about Nepal. In India also, you know, uh, the yes. viewpoint is very Kathmandu centric. Yes. It, yes. Uh, you know, yes. Uh, begins from the yes. airport and ends at the Pashupatinath. Yes. And there are the maximum which we go to, we yes. only talk yes. about Mount Everest. So we need to be informed well. The global audience, the, uh, they need to be informed well about what exactly is Nepal. And I think you are doing a human service to uh, the country. And all the best. Thank you. And now uh, I'll hand it over to you. On behalf of Orange Thank City Culture so Festival, we, ex we sincerely express our gratitude towards your acceptance for the session and knowledge shared with us. I would also like to thank our publisher, Prabhat Prakashan. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. 20 years of existence. Two universities, 23 educational institutes, offering 137 courses, rising group of institutions, a vision beyond.